Hello and welcome. We have a very important and interesting show for you tonight. My guests are the new executive director of the Minnesota affiliate of the ACLU and a board member. John Gordon is with us. He's new at the job as executive director as of October 1st, 2017. We're taping in early November, so really fresh, fresh on the job. Pretty new. Pretty new. Our other guest, my second guest, is Mai Mua, and she is a board member of the ACLU here, and also fairly new as a board member, about a year, a year old. Correct. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. The ACLU is really in the spotlight more than uh, most periods in our history, and. Um, I'm surprised in a way that you wanted to jump in when you were uh, retired from your 40 years with, with uh, Fagri, Baker, and Daniels and doing mediation and some teaching, but to jump into this job is a, kind of another kind of deal, isn't it? Mary, it was just irresistible. Uh, was it? Uh, there is so much need for the work that the ACLU has been doing. Uh, it's such a tremendous organization here in Minnesota and nationally that I f found that it was just irresistible. So you didn't hesitate. You didn't say, let me think about it much. I did. I said, let me think about it. Okay. <laughs> that was easy decision. Some it decisions aren't so easy. And how about you? What prompted you to say yes to being on the board? Because you are an attorney in private practice. Um, busy, busy woman on many boards, and um, what, what drew you to this, this working board position? Well, I volunteered with the ACLU on the Greater Minnesota Racial Justice Project, and so mm -hmm. the ACLU has a lot of programs, and the ACLU has been a lot of work in the community, and I volunteered and worked on some of those programs, and so to be on the board has been a huge addition for me just because it helps me and it also it allows me to help drive the direction of where the organization is going to go. And my your specialty as an attorney is in immigration rights, it correct? Is. And I think the viewers would love to hear just a little bit about your own background because as you were telling me you were born in a refugee camp in Thailand. I was. I was born in a refugee camp in Thailand in October, and my family came over to the U.S. in July. So I was about nine months old when we came over. My family was involved in the secret war in Laos. Um, I'm ethnically Hmong. My family is from Laos. And was your father involved in the war directly? He tells me stories. He has never been involved in any of the organizations or anything like that to go out in the public and say that he was a soldier, but he's told me stories of the things that he's done mm -hmm. back in Laos as well. And so I think it was it's difficult to be a male of his age and to not be involved. I bet. And do you still have family back, um, back there? Is it? Not any immediate family. Um, my mom has siblings that still lives there, okay. but all of my immediate family is here in the U.S. and everyone from my father's side is here in the U.S. And a lot of people have settled from the Hmong population in St. Paul and Minneapolis, haven't they? They have. We have mm -hmm. the largest concentration in Minnesota. That's what I heard. And in the U.S., are we one of the largest, too, for? California's first, we're second, but we do have the most here in a concentrated area. Mm, okay. Well, we're going to talk in a few minutes about several of the really hot issues that the ACLU is tackling, racial justice, immigration, voting rights, um, if we have time, privacy. Um, so. <laughs> I have a lot to ask you both. Um, the mission, though, of the ACLU, John, um, even though you're brand new, I bet you memorize the mission. The mission is, is very clear. Uh, the mission of the ACLU uh, is to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of people nationally, in the case of the national organization, and, and in Minnesota, in the case of our Minnesota organization. 
to protect those civil rights and civil liberties, and really more broadly to protect the rule of law, which we see as being under a huge attack right now. I've always thought the ACLU was um, nonpartisan, but in a way it seems you've been forced to be more partisan in this last year. Am I correct? The ACLU is absolutely nonpartisan. We don't support any political candidates. Uh, we don't contribute to any political campaigns. Uh, we are not Republicans and we are not Democrats. We are partisans and protectors of the Constitution. And we don't really care where the attacks are coming from if they need to be repulsed because that's what we're in the business of doing. And you feel the present leadership in Washington is attacking the Constitution, threatening? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the most direct answer that, I, that I'm likely to give uh, all day or all week. Uh, the, we are seeing an enormous, widespread, broad-based attack on the rule of law coming from the Justice Department, coming from the White House. Uh, and we are doing our best and to do what we can to stop that. We think it's inimical. We think that what's happening in Washington is destructive of the rule of law and the traditions that have kept our country strong. And we are doing everything we can to fight it. And is Minnesota one of the most active affiliates in the country? I gathered we are from the reading I have been doing. This affiliate in Minnesota has a long history of vigorous defense of rights both under the U.S. Constitution and under the Minnesota Constitution, uh, which some people don't know provides even broader rights to people mm -hmm. than the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution. That's interesting. I know that's true also with the Bill of Rights for hospital and long-term care patients. We, we provide more uh, rights than the federal law, so that's a parallel thing. In law school, did you study the Constitution as much now as you wish you had? I really did wish I paid attention more. <laughs> um, I think it was difficult back then because it, I went to school straight through. So I went from undergrad to law school and a lot of it was just studying and I think it's very different. I wish I would have paid attention more because now I'm incorporating it in everything that I do and I see it and I hear it and I practice it all the time. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Jen, would you concur? Absolutely, one of the great joys of this organization is getting to work with people like my and other people on the board of directors who have spent decades in many cases immersed in these issues. Our legal director, Teresa Nelson, is a great constitutional law scholar. She was paying attention during law school in con law, and uh, one of the great joys of the job is working with her, the rest of the staff, and the board. And Teresa is still on the staff, I understand? Correct, she yes. has been the legal director. She was gracious enough to step into the executive director's job on an interim basis until they chose a new executive director and so she has now resumed her job as legal director where she's just a star. Well, this is a great segue. You didn't know I was going to use it, but um, Teresa had a quote, and when I was reading about racial justice and the ACLU here, um, her quote really jumped out at me, and I want to read it to you and then get your feedback. She wrote, the ACLU will continue to fight for racial justice. We must end the prevailing policing paradigm where police departments behave more like occupying forces, imposing their will to control communities. This type of us versus them policing antagonizes many communities of color by casting a blanket of suspicion over an entire race, often under the guise of solving crime. That is a really strong um, statement and would you each want to comment on it? I'll take a, I'll take a shot at that first. I think it's, it is a great encapsulation of the mission. Uh, I think that, that we are seeing a situation in which in Minnesota we pride ourselves on having a long history of progressive politics and uh, uh, respect for other people. But in point of fact, 
uh, in Minnesota, we have uh, racial uh, disparities uh, that vastly exceed many areas of the country. And in, in some studies, uh, what we see is that the racial disparities in Minnesota are greater than they are in any of the other states. In uh, any, and, and no, so that's... We, we're, we look back on our tradition of Hubert Humphrey and other great politicians and we pat ourselves on the back sometimes. The fact is that the uh, statistics don't always bear that out. That's a statistic I hadn't heard that we were at the bottom there and that's, that's disturbing. It depends on the measure you use, but we are doing well in some areas. In other areas, we are doing very poorly and we need to fix it. We need to fix the way that uh, police departments treat communities of color. Mm -hmm. We need more community-based policing. We need police who are more active and integrated into the communities that they serve uh, because the situation we've got now is that, is that the police are viewed as an enemy, as an occupying force, and that just can't go on. It is not safe or good for the communities, and it is not safe or good for the police themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, everybody is on edge, really. Um, and would you say from your personal experience with your family and friends in the Hmong community that there is fear of the police here in Minnesota? There is great fear here in Minnesota, especially in not only just in my family, but in the line of work that I do. I practice primarily immigration law and we see it a lot. It is extremely problematic with uh, racial profiling, certain individuals getting pulled over. Mm -hmm. And I see it a lot also in the Latino community. I had a client who was a victim in a motor vehicle accident. She didn't have a driver's license, but she had a ID, a counselor ID card on her, and she was taken into custody. So for a situation like that, typically what would happen is she would have been cited for driving without a license. Right. But because of her ethnic background, she was taken into custody and turned over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and she was put into removal proceedings. Mm -hmm. So we see stuff like that a lot, what's happening mm -hmm. on the ground versus what should be happening. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's so disturbing. Um, the argument that I believe came down in the 80s from the Supreme Court of, Minas of the US was that a police officer, if he or she fears for her safety or his safety, has rights to become, you know, very violent in a sense. And um, that seems to have been something that's caused an awful lot of what we're dealing with now in terms of racial justice. Um, would you agree, John? You, you certainly hear the claim a lot um, that, that that officers are fearful for their lives or for the lives of others. Sometimes that's justified, sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, when you've got fear that is based on the way people look um, and their heritage and their nationality, um, that is not a legitimate basis mm -hmm. for what you're talking about mm -hmm. at all. Right, right. Um, I believe Teresa also commented on the Philando Castile case and said this was a miscarriage of justice. Um, has that been something that has reverberated through the office and through the organization? Absolutely, we worked very hard to uh, get access to the, to the dash cam video and, and the visual recording of what happened in that. Mm -hmm. uh, we were completely stonewalled for a long period of time until finally the, the, the evidence was released in connection with the criminal trial. Uh, but that really is, is unacceptable. That kind of information is public data. And one of our primary goals is to get public data released to the public so that they can find out how people are acting when they are employed by municipalities, when they're employed to protect the public. And so that is something that we are working very hard on. And we worked hard on that case in particular. Um, and so it must have been very disappointing, though, the outcome. There was, uh, there was, it was very disappointing uh, to, to find that we'd been stonewalled mm -hmm. in trying to get access to this video. Uh, mm -hmm. And now there is, uh, we feel that there is a danger that this is going to be repeated unless we can get a different kind of rule in terms of when this kind of data needs to be released. 
Does that new rule come via legislation or via court kind of precedent? We're working on it in the courts and we have a number of cases going now uh, under the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, mm -hmm. which is Minnesota's analog to the Freedom of Information Act. And so we're using that to try to find out on behalf of the public how public officials are doing their jobs. Um, with police uh, in Minneapolis being asked now to carry cameras all the time, that should improve things. Um, we'll see if that happens, all right? Yes, we will. Um, I need to shift gears just because I got a signal that we're half done already, and I want to ask you about immigration next. Um, lots going on. Um, the case that's a national case that has has just puzzled me so much is the case of the young girl, Rosa Marie, in Texas, I believe, 10-year-old cerebral palsy, um, needed surgery. Her cousin took her uh, for surgery. On the way, they were stopped by the Border Patrol. Can you, can you explain how this could have happened? Well, the focus right now is removal. In the past, with the Obama administration, there was priorities of who to remove from the U.S. And if there are individuals that are a danger, if there are individuals that are a security uh, risk or folks who've been convicted of certain crimes, those were priorities. And the government had prosecutorial discretion over who to remove and who not to remove. And so, but now everyone who is in the U.S. without authorization or who has overstayed is a priority. There isn't a specific priority in place. It is everyone that it's in the US. So for example, like this girl, she is here without authorization. And because she doesn't have any authorization to be in the US, she can be removed under the law. And her parents are living here uh, in Texas, correct? But would she be sent, because she was, was stopped, would she be sent away from them just as a child? I'm, I haven't quite followed up on the case, so I'm not sure if her parents okay. are documented or undocumented. I would believe that they're undocumented. I believe they are. And so under this, these type of circumstances, she would still be removed to her home country. Without, and her parents also then? If her parents are caught and put into proceedings, they would be as well. But I was you know, really wondering, could they separate a child from the parents in this kind of a unusual? circumstance, it seemed very, very awful to me. And that's what we're fighting right now on all the time is family reunification mm -hmm. and keeping families together. And so a lot of cases that's been the theme is whether or not we can keep them here. If there's any form of relief available, would we be asking for, based on hardship, extreme hardship to the family if the individual was separated or if there's a way to keep someone here because it would be extreme hardship to the family and to cancel the removal. So there's a different types of relief that we could try, but sometimes there are individuals who have nothing available. As an immigration lawyer, are you inundated right now with work? I'm guessing you are with what's we, going on. I, it is very difficult at this time, especially with all of the enforcement that's been happening with the number of people that have been detained and have been put into removal proceedings. I'm thinking the mental health of everybody who is under uh, this cloud of possible deportation must be just really under stress, you know? It's just ghastly. Uh, it is the ghastly. fact is That's that immigration and customs enforcement appears to have no compunction whatsoever about how many families they break up or how they break them up or what the effect is yeah. on, on other family members. Maya and I worked on a case together um, in, in which a uh, Cambodian national uh, was here. He was subject to deportation proceedings, um, uh, but otherwise absolutely law, not only law-abiding, uh, but employed in a good job, supporting his U.S. citizen wife, supporting his three U.S. citizen children, and ICE kept him locked up in 
one county jail after another because they basically rent rooms in various county jails in different places in Minnesota for more than a year, not because of any crime that he committed, not as punishment for any crime, but because they were trying to deport him to Cambodia, as it turns out, a country that he had never lived in. Um, and when finally uh, we were working together, able to get a federal judge to order his release, um, he, his children fell back into his arms as he walked out of the detention facility mm -hmm. at Fort Snelling. And then the very next day, he went back to his employer and was rehired immediately mm. because he was that valuable an employee mm. and that valuable a member of society. And yet a year had been, over a year had been taken out of his life for no purpose whatsoever. Yeah, it just seems so inhumane and so unproductive for the country, for you know the family, obviously. Um, in terms of the ACLU's mission specifically with immigration, is it, how would you state it in a nutshell? I would state it in a nutshell as follows. The people who are living in this country have got the protection of the Bill of Rights. And this president and this attorney general are not entitled to take those rights away from them. Mm -hmm. So you're going to fight? Every day. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And we've been doing a lot of community outreach, advocacy, legal action work, know your rights training. So the ACLU has been very involved in doing that just so that, especially with the immigrant community, so they have a better understanding of what their rights are. And you've got a card, I understand, that you give out to people? We do. That is know your rights. I, I'd love to see the card and maybe you can send it to me. We'd be eager to do that. Would you like it in English or would you like it in other languages? Because we've got both. Well, send it to me in, <laughs> in at least uh, Spanish and English. Voting rights, I'm gonna shift gears. We're, we're so tight on time here. Um, I read that 52,000 Minnesotans can't vote every year because of having a felony conviction. And of those, I read that, tell me if I'm correct or not, 75% of those 52,000 are not in jail or prison, they're out in the community working, living among us, um, and yet they can't vote. And you are pushing hard, it sounds like, to change that law. How is it going? Voting restoration is a project that we are very interested in and we are devoting resources to it. Uh, the fact is that we think that every member of the society uh, should have the right to vote, uh, not because it's so much fun, not because it's, uh, uh, something that, 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 that is a perk of some kind, but it's really integral to people being a, a valuable member of society. So what we've done over and over again is that we've thrown people in jail. We have, in most cases, let them out of jail eventually. But the, the fact is that we deprive them of their rights as citizens, and we, in many cases, sentence them to what amounts to a life sentence of unemployment. Uh, because they've got a record uh, that people use to deny employment and deny benefits. And we and think that's just all wrong. And this ties back into racial justice too, doesn't it? Because of the disproportionate amount of people of color that are in jail. Exactly right. It's got huge racial implications. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said before, the racial disparities in this state are shameful. I want to ask you just a little bit about freedom of speech. We just have a few minutes left, but I'm being asked by my cameraman to be sure we put up the website for the ACLU. So it is www.aclu-mn.org. And the national um, website is just aclu.org. Both are very, very helpful. Lots of, lots of information on both. Let me just add that it's not just text and a bunch of lawyerese. Uh, no, there's, vi there's videos on those websites. There's photographs. Uh, right. There's an enormous amount of resource uh, in, in both of them. So we're very proud of both those websites. Yes, I, I was extremely impressed. And I look at a lot of websites. They're very user friendly and yeah, very understandable. Thanks. We have a tremendous communications department who works mm -hmm. very hard on that. We're also very active on 
on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So there are a lot of ways to keep in touch with the ACLU and the ACLU of Minnesota. And we should put a plug in here too. You are using volunteers um, more than I would have thought when I uh, first started uh, reading about, about you and learning more. So people can get a hold of you and sign up for all kinds of different jobs, can't they? Right, the, the, the website, as you said, www.aclu-mn.org uh, has a number of contact links in there and we are very eager to have people participate. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, there's volunteering in the office. Uh, there's non-legal jobs. We are very reliant on pro bono lawyers in this community uh, who contribute their time to help us work on cases and we co-counsel with them on many cases. And so there are a lot of opportunities for lawyers to contribute as well as non-lawyers. And I bet you can you know, shake the bushes with some of your lawyer friends and bring, bring some in. I've been very fortunate to have gotten to know a lot of people in this community. Yeah, 40 years. Um, just one last quick question. We have a few seconds left. The football players who are taking the knee, as they call it, that's a symbolic gesture related to freedom of speech. Is it legal or not? It's absolutely in the mainstream of protest against government policies and against social conditions that is part of the long and proud history in this country. Would you agree? I'm sure I would agree, yes. Sure you would. Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming down. And I wish we had you, Mary. two more hours here to, to learn from you. It's, um, it's fascinating work you're both doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're thank very you pleased us. to be here. And thank you for joining us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>